All right, welcome to AP Video 10.6. Here we'll look at a little introduction to heating and cooling curves, and uh, also look at some of the calculations associated with them. All right, get yourself ready to go, and let's begin. So heating curves um, kind of look like this. Um, oftentimes when you ask a student, you know, let's say you start with some ice, and it says heat, heat that ice all the way until it gets to steam. Well, what would a heating curve look like? A lot of students think like the temperature would just rise and rise and rise, and it's just going to go solid, liquid, gas. But it turns out a heating curve looks more like this. Uh, yes, the temperature is going to rise like it does right here, and then it's going to actually plateau until all that solid becomes a liquid. And then once it's all liquid, then the temperature can start to rise again and go up. And then once it starts to cha uh, phase change again, it plateaus like this, and then it goes to, starts to rise again once it becomes uh, once all the liquid is a gas. So a couple quick things, I'm going to kind of color coat the, the screen here for a second. Give me one second here to do that. Okay, so now I got a color code here. You can kind of easily, more easily see the, the different regions here. So this is kind of like region 1 right here. And region 1, I wish you could see it a little better. I'm sorry about that. Uh, region 1 says heating a solid. So basically energy flows into your solid, which starts to make the molecular vibrations in the solid uh, increase and the temperature is going to rise. Then, when you move to this region here, uh, the particles become so energetic they start to break loose from their solid positions and you change from a solid to a liquid. Notice the temperature does not change during this region, it stays nice and flat like a plateau there, and all of the energy is being used to convert the, the solid into a liquid. Then, when you get to this region here, once it's all liquid now, um, energy starts to flow into liquid and the fluid motion increases so the particles start to move around a lot more as the temperature rises. Eventually, we reach this next plateau here. The particles become so energetic they, be, they break loose from their IMFs. IMFs are the only things holding liquid particles together. But now they have so much energy they break loose from them and they start to change from a liquid to a gas. Again, notice the temperature does not change at this point. All of the energy at this point is being used to convert liquids into gases overcome the IMFs. Eventually we reach this region over here which is like region 5 and uh, the energy now flows into the gas and it causes the gas particles to move faster and faster as the temperature rises. So these are called heating curves. A um, couple other things I'd like you to be able to draw on these heating curves. So if you have one of these, like one of the first things you do is you do your um, x and y axis and I know they wrote the word temperature up here but typically you'd write temp you know on the on the y and on the x axis you're going to write the word time like that so I'll cross those off there um, then you can just go ahead and draw a very general shape like this like you guys can literally um, try to get a different color here so I'll go with this darker red so you would draw a heating curve by drawing a a line right here like so then you would draw a nice flat plateau like this then draw another increase like this plateau and increase. So it's always three increases, boom, 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 three increases, and then uh, two plateaus in between those. Where your plateaus are, right here, like this is the plateau, you want to put down what the melting point temperature is. Where the other plateau exists, you want to put down where the boiling point temperature is. So if this is water, you would put zero degrees Celsius here and a hundred degrees Celsius here. So all heating curves basically have this nice general shape. Uh, go up, plateau, go up, plateau, go up. And the plateaus, the first one's the melting point, the second one is the boiling point. And that's a heating curve. If uh, cooling were to occur, it has just the exact opposite shape. Okay, um, Basically you would go down first, plateau, go down again, plateau, go down and again, like so. Now each of the spots where it's angled that's always where the solid, liquid, and gases are. And the plateaus between them, just remember the plateaus mean the phase changes. Um, so gas to liquid in this case, and now in here it's going to be liquid to a solid. And again, it's still temperature here, still time here. And you can put your, your uh, melting point here and your boiling point there. So that's what a heating curve and a cooling curve looks like. The next step is to actually kind of look at some of the calculations uh, that go along with this. So it turns out this area right here where we have solid, liquid, and gas, I call that steps one, three, 
and 5 essentially. Um, notice how the temperature is changing. The temperature is changing on those places. And that's when you're going to use this equation. It should look pretty familiar to you. That's our MCAT equation. So whenever the temperature is changing, we use the MCAT equation, where you're trying to solve for the heat being either uh, endothermic positive energy needed or exothermic released uh, is happening there. Um, and you solve for this by plugging in the mass in grams using the specific heat capacity, which is letter C, the amount of energy required to change the temperature one gram, or try to change the temperature one degree Celsius for one gram of that substance. And uh, also use delta T, which is the change in temperature. You need to figure out your final spot and your initial spot. And then you subtract the difference for those two things. A couple of really important things to, to point out quick here. Um, specific heat capacity is in joules, so underline that. And it also is in grams. So just make sure you're working with mass and make sure you understand you're going to be in joules when you're done calculating. The other important, really important thing to recognize is that it's different for each estate of matter. So if we have the C for ice, there's a different C for liquid water, and there's a different C for steam or water vapor. So just make sure you watch out that there is different uh, C values based on the, the state of matter you're working with. Um, so we're looking at those spots again right there. Next, now we're going to look at these spots right here. We're going to look at the plateaus. When you do the plateaus, there's actually a different equation. And it's Q equals N times delta H. Where delta H equals either delta H of fusion or delta H of vaporization. And the heat of fusion, fusion means like solid and liquid, like you're fusing the liquid particles into a solid. So it's, it's that solid liquid boundary there. It's the amount of energy required to convert one mole from a solid to a liquid. Delta H of vaporization, heat of vaporization, delta H vap, is the one we go from liquid to a gas. And that should make a little more sense. Vaporization is going from liquid to a gas. And same thing as before, it's the amount of energy required to convert one mole of a liquid to a solid. Um, so for example, delta H of vaporization for uh, see here, water I guess, you know, trying to go to uh, liquid to a gas. Uh, delta H vaporization for water is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So a couple things to notice here, it makes it different from the previous one. We're going to be in kilojoules when we solve for it, and you do need to be in moles when solving or when you're doing calculations as well. So that's what N stands for. N in these equations here, just like in gases, remember, oops, uh, N stands for moles. And then this is going to be in kilojoules per mole, so moles going to cancel. But more importantly, we will actually be in kilojoules when we solve with this one. And I think in your notes you might need to change that, so it should be kilojoules. Uh, when you solve for Q here, it's actually going to be in kilojoules. Um, that's pretty much it for the most part. Oops. Um, if you had to solve a problem now, let's say you uh, put my temperatures in here for water. It might be different for other substances. But let's say you have ice that starts at negative 30 right here. And you want to heat it till it becomes a, a gas at 150 degrees Celsius. There's really five calculations to do. Calculation 1, calculation 3, calculation 5. And you will do that with this equation. We use the MCAT equation when we're calculating those spots because the temperature is changing. Oops. And uh, so we got 1, 3, and 5. And then when you're calculating the rest of the temperature changes and, and um, the energy needed here, calculations 2 and 4, you'll be using these two equations, which are basically the same thing. You just have a different value to plug in for heat of fusion and for heat of vaporization. But once you're all done and you find out the, the joules for those spots and the kilojoules for these spots, you then want to convert your, all your joules into kilojoules. And then what you do is you add each of those five things together. And that's what you need to do. Um, so come ready to practice some of these in class because they, they're a little tricky at first. seems a little overwhelming, but they really aren't too bad. Good job.